This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. This is Carl Malamud. We are speaking today with Amanda Dunn, who is a program planner in the Office of Programs, Strategy, and Technology at the Government Publishing Office. And she is also the product owner of GovInfo. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, Hey, uh, what's a product owner and what's GovInfo? Let's start with that. What is a product owner and what is GovInfo? So a product owner is someone who is basically responsible for um, ownership of communicating what needs to be done for a given product. And in our case, the product for me is the public facing um, aspects of GovInfo. So what is GovInfo? Well, I can kind of start from today, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about what where, where we became to be for GovInfo. So um, it's been around now, GovInfo, for six years, just this month, but our mandate goes back quite um, a long time, and it started with the passing of the GPO, Electronic Information Access Enhancement Act of 1993. Um, so that is Public Law 103.40. Uh, all codified in a Title 44. Um, we started as GPO Access, it was called, and that was created in 1994. Um, and it was just a basic 1990s era website, rudimentary search, and so on. Fast forward to 2009, the federal digital system came into play, um, or FDSIS. And I actually, I was involved, I started a GPO in 2007. So I knew GPO access, I was involved in FDSIS. And um, so FDSIS kind of went many steps further. Uh, as far as making government information available. And so um, it was three things, uh, and it is GovInfo as well, is three things. So it is a um, content management system, uh, managing content through its life cycle. It is a preservation repository. And just a little note on preservation repository, fun fact, we are the only ISO 16363 certified trustworthy po- dep- repository um, in the world. So it's a pretty cool thing. And so in addition to preservation repository, we are also a public website. And that's my sphere is the public website. Um, and how inter- how users interact with GovInfo. Um, and just a quick note, when we say, what is GovInfo, people are like, what can I do there? Where, what is it? What's in there? Um, and we are government documents. GovInfo is um, a place for government, for content, uh, for publications produced by the government from all three branches, actually. So um, maybe some other websites have government information, but we provide access to all, all content from all three branches um, for federal government information. So, so what kind of information is, is yeah. it, I, you know, I, I know you have the congressional record, you have the federal register. What else do you have on there? Right. So we have over 40 content collections. Um, and we range from things like you mentioned, the congressional record, which is basically the daily issuance of the works of Congress. We also have the federal register, which is kind of the daily works of the federal rulemaking bodies and the executive branch. Um, public and private laws, congressional materials like bills, congressional reports, congressional hearings, uh, committee prints. Uh, it's just a lot of congressional um, and legislative information, certainly um, statutes at large, the United States Code. And then swiveling over to the federal uh, rulemaking side of things, we have the Federal Register, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, documents produced by the Office of the President. So we have the budget. And we have public papers of the president. And also we have content from 151 uh, federal courts from appellate uh, district and bankruptcy courts um, and a couple other specialty courts as well. So quite the scope and breadth of content. Um, And just a note on that, while we have all of this great content, our users are actually everybody. So that's something that is special and unique too. So literally the American public. So we have your regular user who maybe, oh, I read about something. I heard about something in the news. I want to go read this law. So we have those users. We have academic researchers who really dig into the corpus of our content and do analysis. And um, we have folks who go grab a bunch of the content and use it for their own databases or resources and creating different things with our content and our metadata. Um, And then we have our our stakeholders that produce the content. So um, folks and organizations on the Hill and agencies like the Office of the Federal Register, National Archives, and other agencies. So all of these people 
um, have a have an, a vested interest in the content that we um, provide access to. So it's a it's a fun problem to have when we talk about okay, how do we meet their needs and make sure we don't hinder the needs of others. And um, but that's that's who we serve is uh, the American public. So I, I would think there's three ways that one can get data. One is, yes. is bulk access. The second is an API. And the third is a website. Uh, maybe we can walk through those, those three different pieces. I think I'll start with just the public website. Um, and that's everybody has access. We have different ways to search. You can do basic searching or complex searching using advanced search forms and fields. You can use citation search. We have so much metadata that is automatically created out of that processing of these collections. Um, it's very specialized to each collection and it's so rich and robust. So we build our front-facing uh, search experience based on this metadata. We also make this metadata available to the public so they can actually access metadata in XML. Um, so this public search experience, um, you know, kind of what you think about with a search engine. Um, and there you can access content in the formats it's made available, um, PDF, ASCII text, um, XML. And we've continuously made XML available for collections. Maybe it wasn't available at first and now it is. So we've done that over the years. Um, so through these different ways, um, browsing, a lot of um, folks traditionally like to browse long lists um, where you start like searching from a year and kind of drilling down. You can use filters and um, create complex queries using metadata fields and values too. So that's kind of that public um, user um, experience. And we try to facilitate both the general user who might not quite know what they're looking for and the specialized user who um, maybe they only really, really care about one publication or a set of publications. Um, but we uh, have an experience designed for, for all of them to do. Um, and then we have uh, ways to grab a lot of content. So you mentioned bulk XML. Uh, we have bulk XML uh, formats available where users can go grab large sets of rich structured XML data um, and then just like download them all at once. So uh, they're available in XML and um, JSON endpoints for select collections. And the latest actually that we've added was um, bill status. So um, we're constantly making more things available that wasn't previously available. So we actually go back to 2003 with bill status, bulk, bulk XML, but we have um, a lot of the other collections available in bulk too. And I would say that the folks that are interested in that kind of grabbing a lot of content um, all at once are maybe um, other resources or websites or institutions that want to grab a lot of content at once. And then we do have a public API. We actually launched our public API in 2018 and all of our content is available to grab via this API. Um, we have, we use the words packages, um, information packages when we talk about our system. So um, like one package is one day's issue of the federal register. Um, and then we have granules that are broken out amongst the different packages. Uh, one congressional bill is one package. One volume of the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, is one package. And we're constantly adding new endpoints for our API. We're never static. We evolve. We have deployments throughout the year where we're doing new collections, collection updates, like I mentioned, new API endpoints um, and parameters too. And we do all of these things in this uh, really iterative way because we talk with our stakeholders. So um, we learned that um, certain elements of an API would be valuable. So we have backlogs and we prioritize them and we slide them into roadmaps um, throughout the course of the year and we kind of build those new things. So um, our API is something we're really proud of and again, we're building on and we have a link service available too. So for those um, who want to create predictable links to content packages and granules, they can use our link service as well. And um, we have RSS feeds for those who want to get notifications of new content. And sitemaps are available for developers to crawl to. And we have a really great presence on GitHub. So when we're talking about our stakeholders and if someone says, well, I want to see this in an RSS, uh, we actually um, did make a change to our RSS. We learned that um, they wanted to see bill versions available uh, as the, uh, a piece there. So um, constantly trying to make 
sources available for, for I guess you would say a developer type of individual. Well, what kind of a user uses your API? Congress.gov um, is one of our partners and they also, is, they're a data consumer um, of ours. So they're one example of, of a group that um, uses our API and they um, use our metadata. So we work closely with them. How much traffic do you get? So we have had cumulative retrievals as of just this January, and that's all retrievals. So think about all the things we just talked about and the different ways people access documents and information packages on GetInfo, I guess. Um, is And since January 2009 now, so that's when FGSIS came to be, um, that number is now up to 5.1 billion. And our average monthly is around 70 million. Um, but in 2021, we had about 830. So what is this, this thing built on? Like your search engine, is, is that an open source? It is. Or? We do. We use open source technologies. Um, we use um, solar, mm -hmm. uh, the solar search engine. Um, and, you know, constantly kind of tweaking that and... Um, following upgrades and different things. And um, it's been a good experience using solar. And yeah. the, the GUI and the content management, is that all open source based or did you write? Uh, your own? Open source. We have a team, uh, you know, of software developers. Is, is the whole thing like on GitHub, if I were a state, could I download GovInfo and stand up my own version or is it just individual components or just there? The content is available um, on GitHub and like if there is documentation, I see. So, how big is this operation? GovInfo, are you hundreds of people? I mean, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, um, you know, around 20, 25 or so. Um, it's not all developers, you know. So, we have a team of, it's, it's product owners like me uh, who either work with the public side of things or other um, components. We have search uh, engineers, we have um, system ad admins, DBAs, type of thing. So it's it's a mix. Your core data is encoded in XML. The the Office of the Federal Register does the CFR and the Federal Register, the, the Code of Federal Regulations. Congress does the bills. They do all the XML coding, and you're the repository. Or do you actually do the content encoding as well? There are some processes where they're produced in XML format. It just depends on what content we're talking about because there's sort of different streams for our different content groups. Um, I guess maybe it's relevant to talk a little bit about how um, there are there is something called XPUB. XPUB is basically the new way of producing content that GPO is in the process of, of working on. The output will be responsive HTML formats for different things. So what actually is coming soon is this new format available for congressional bills, resolutions and amendments, and then public laws and statutes at large. And there's actually information about this on GitHub. So it's github.com slash USGPO slash XPUB. And it's going to replace the old text format but it's literally producing content in new, new ways. We used to use microcomp, and now they're basically migrating the whole composition system to be XML-based. And so that's an ongoing process um, at GPO. But we certainly reap the benefits of that. Um, we get this great new um, responsive formats for content, and that's going to grow over time. Um, but our base formats now are you know, PDF. We still have the old text versions for a lot. Um, and then, like I said, making more XML um, available. And, you know, we also have, we haven't talked about digitized content yet. And maybe that's a, a quick minute to talk about that. So most of our content, like the, the corpus, it all began when GPO Access was created in 1993, 1994, 95. So content was born digital then. We call that day forward content. Um, but we also have a lot of great digitized historical content that we're making available in GovInfo. Um, just another example of growth, we 
worked on just most recently the U.S. Uh, congressional serial set, a super important body of legislative content. Uh, there's been, um, ever since I began at GPO, certainly like almost 15 years ago, I've been hearing about this congressional serial set and we finally made the first kind of output of congressional serial set content available just last year. It's a huge effort. It's a really big body of work. It's going to take years to get it all digitized. But we work on these partnerships where, um, like, for the example, that's with Law Library of Congress. They digitize. We make it available um, on GovInfo. So um, we actually started with just a handful of Congresses so far for um, the congressional series that, but we do have content going back to 1818. Um, we did the bound re congressional record a couple years ago, going back to 1873, uh, the federal register digitized going back to 1936, uh, statutes at large, 1951, and we'll eventually be getting more statutes at large, uh, public papers of the president to 1929. And I guess my point is, um, is we're weaving in this digitized content into the content that is born digital, um, and, the user shouldn't have to know that this was digitized and this was born digital, um, but we're trying to make that uh, kind of connection for them and put it all in the same place and it's in the same collection. Um, as much metadata as we can, it's a little bit harder to get the metadata from the digitized content because um, just in the nature of the way it's created, but we're making a lot of strides in that. By XPUB, you yeah. mean uh, U.S. legislative markup? Yes, United States legislative markup, um, kind of the new standard schema uh, for legislative you know, publications. And we have USLM available um, in GovInfo uh, for some collections. I think we have enrolled bills with other versions kind of next up. Um, we have public and private laws in available in USLM. Um, but yes, it's it's sort of the next XML. Uh, there, there's GPO in the middle, the publishing office, mm -hmm. but your, your stakeholders have invested a lot. Yes. Um, there's actually a bulk data task force and um, it's GPO and it's Library of Congress and it's um, organizations on the Hill. Um, and they they definitely, that's part of their entire mandate and initiative. I'm not in those meetings, but a lot of the things that come out of those meetings are the things that our teams work on. Um, so it's great that partnership with citizens and advocates and government offices is amazing. That's how it's great. It's the way it should be. Totally. Thank you, Amanda. We've been speaking with Amanda Dunn at the Government Printing Office. I'm sorry, Government Publishing Office. I always use okay. the old-fashioned name. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.